Nobody thought a thing like this was possible. A pandemic that affected every single person on the planet. Why didn't anyone stop this? For weeks and weeks, the Chinese government kept us silent. This is the result of taking a natural virus and mucking around with it. Hey, presto, the perfect human pathogen. That actually would make a good bioweapon. It escaped from the lab. They had had an accident. The first cluster worked into Wuhan Institute of Virology. They silenced journalists and disappeared some of them. It won't stop there. What led you to believe this came from a Wuhan lab? It was obvious there were body bags. COVID-19. Like you, it wasn't until early 2020 that I started paying attention to this. Then came the investigation, then came the revelations, and then the writing. Tonight, join me as I tell you what I've discovered about where the virus came from and when it first appeared. Mr. President, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. You've seen all of the intelligence. When do you think the virus first started? Well, some of the intelligence is classified, and I can't talk about it, but common sense tells you it most likely, and when I say most likely, like 95% came from the Wuhan lab. Uh, I don't know if they had bad thoughts or whether it was gross incompetence, but one way or the other, it came out of Wuhan and it came from the Wuhan lab. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for His Excellency Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, President of the People's Republic of China, and Chairman the Central Military Commission. They're the Olympic Games for military athletes. Held every four years, Wuhan was the host city in 2019. And I didn't even know about the military games until someone from the Army uh, called me in, in December of 2020 and asked me if I could explain what happened at the Wuhan military games and whether these people had fallen sick with an early uh, a strain, uh, emerging strain of COVID. As the site of a potential virus super spreader, it doesn't get much bigger than this. And in the weeks and months that followed, reports emerged of athletes becoming sick. It, it is suspicious. I mean, we, we do see some indications in our own data you know, that NIH has, that there was COVID circulating in the United States, certainly in the earliest month, of, you know, as early as early December, possibly earlier than that. I mean, some of these work, these people who came back from those games were sick with something. More than 9,000 athletes were there. Two weeks later, they returned home to more than 100 countries. Oh, I know that. People got sick. I believe their French uh, athletes got sick. I believe their Germans. Uh, some Americans got sick too. But getting sick in Wuhan, in that particular time frame, of the kind of symptoms that were very similar to what would later known to be coronavirus symptoms, uh, that obviously deserve investigation. No one was ever tested, but there was one man who knew something was wrong. China's most famous defector to the United States, the father of his country's democracy movement. I thought that the Chinese government would take this opportunity to spread the virus during the military games, as many foreigners would show up there. Simon, let's start with the night Wei Jingsheng came over for dinner at your house on November 22. What was different about that night? There was an urgency about um, Wei's manner. I mean, Wei normally is a very relaxed person. 
But um, that night was a little bit different because he talked in a, in a, almost a different tone. Diamond Liu and Wei Jingsheng are close friends. She's a high-profile human rights advocate. He was once a Communist Party insider. He'd come to Diamond looking for help. Who could he tell in America there was a virus on the loose in Wuhan? Did he think this was a coronavirus? Yes, he did say it was coronavirus. How did he know about it? Well, in the, um, uh, among the Chinese uh, um, uh, di diaspora, there have been talks about it. And Wei, being who, who he is, uh, tend to be uh, the recipients of um, many information. People seek him out. Wei Jingsheng spent 18 years in Chinese prisons for standing up to Beijing. In 97, he made global headlines when he defected to the United States. Wei still has impeccable contacts high up in the party. And they were telling him a virus was spreading in Wuhan in October. <laughs> When did you first hear that there was a virus in Wuhan? Was it during the time of the military games? Yes. I learned there was an unusual exercise by the Chinese government during the military games. And so I told Diamond about the possibility of the Chinese government using some strange weapons, including biological weapons because I knew they were doing experiments of that sort. There was nothing in the news at the time. I mean, it was, no, no one had mentioned a thing. No, no one had mentioned a day. Diamond wasn't the first person Wei told there was a coronavirus in Wuhan. He now tells me he passed on the same information to US intelligence and one politician as early as October 2019. It turns out Wei's warning wasn't the only piece of intelligence the agencies had at that time that warned of an outbreak in Wuhan. We knew this, but we didn't know it. My shock was that we had actually could have had foreknowledge. David Asher is a veteran weapons investigator. He led a US government task force into the origins of COVID-19. And in late 2020, he unearthed intelligence that Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists fell sick with COVID-like symptoms. But what alarmed him was just how long Washington had sat on this classified intel. I was very surprised at the level of detail that they were able to produce uh, around information that they had uh, probably collected well over a year before that. So in November uh, of 2020, we learned things that they had collected in November 2019. Wuhan is located in the central Chinese province of Hubei. It's home to 11 million people. Also in this sprawling metropolis is one of the world's leading biological research facilities, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was built by the French and included a cooperation agreement, which meant that French scientists would be included in the research groups in Wuhan, and that they would work together on this virological research. By the end of 2014, they had effectively excluded all the French that were in the Institute. And, you know, the suspicion on the part of the French was that, you know, the, 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 they were pushed out because of the Chinese military interest 
in the work. So what could this indicate about the type of research they were intending to undertake at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Well, I mean, the suggestion would be its relevance to biological warfare. In terms of coronavirus research, what was going on in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Well, so what we, we, we do know, I mean, is, is that they were one of the world's leading repository of uh, coronaviruses. That research was headed up by Xie Zheng Li. They call her the Batwoman. She's China's top virologist, and her specialty, bat viruses. So it does look like COVID-19, you know, at some point did originate as a, as a bat virus, that I think most people would accept uh, that as a premise. The question then is more about how did those changes occur that make it unique uh, and that make it so well adapted to humans? In 2012, Shizeng Li hit pay dirt. At a disused mine in southwestern China, six workers fell ill after clearing away bat manure. Three died from a coronavirus. But Beijing covered it up and told no one. To a virologist uh, obsessed with SARS-like viruses, that mine was a gold mine, <laughs> pardon the pun, for new uh, viruses to study. And they've returned to it at least five times, the Mojiang mine. That's what Xi Jinping has been doing for two decades. She's been going around various bat caves, mostly in Yunnan, China, and collecting bat viruses. Hundreds of samples were brought back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There, scientists were slicing, manipulating, and combining genetic sequences from different viruses together. The story of, of the mine's intriguing, one, because most of us only first learnt about it, uh, you know, in, in early 2020, uh, when the Wuhan Institute of Virology said, we've gone to all the viruses, coronaviruses we've got stored in the lab um, to look to see, um, did we actually have COVID-19 in our repository? And then they said, um, we didn't find, uh, you know, COVID-19, but hey presto, we found, um, you know, the very closest genetic relative to this, uh, which is rat G13, here it is. RATG13 is the name of one coronavirus they extracted from the bats in those caves. It is 96.2% identical to the virus that causes COVID-19. Then the natural question is, did they find COVID-19 on one of those trips? And if so, why haven't they told us about it? Um, or did they manipulate uh, you know, rat G13 or one of the other coronaviruses that they found in this cave, and that created COVID-19. And of course, that always raises the question, well, how far did they push the boundaries? You know, what, what research were they doing? By early 2020, this administration has developed a very healthy and justifiable uh, suspicion of a lot of things China saying is doing and China promised to do. Miles Yu was Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's principal China advisor. As 2020 rolled in, Miles started paying close attention to Wuhan. For weeks and weeks, the Chinese government uh, kept silent on the outbreak, They're not saying anything, as if nothing is happening. So citizen journalists are beginning to send out their videos and reports and the hospital uh, situation reports on a daily basis.
我们今年的疫情堪比零三年的非典，而两次疫情的爆炸都是因为对于事实的隐瞒，对于信息的封锁。我们不能一错再错了。One of those citizen journalists is Chen Kuishi. He's also a lawyer. Chen had heard China was covering up the unfolding tragedy in Wuhan, so he went there and started posting videos. 那个护士还主动问我：“你看没看网上那三具尸体挺走廊里的视频？”我说：“看了。”对，那个官方已经辟谣了，但是是真的。我说：“啥？官方已经辟谣了，但是是真的。” And then he disappeared. Mr. President, what evidence were you presented with that convinced you that it did, in all likelihood, come from a lab? Well, I started hearing stories that you have also. That there were lots of body bags outside of the lab, and people were saying there are a lot of people lying down on the streets of Wuhan, and there were body bags. Body bags outside of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I heard that a long time ago, and if they did in fact have body bags, that was one little indication, wasn't it? Was that was that something that came from the agencies, the intelligence agencies? Is that what they were telling you? I don't know where it came from. Ask China, but you're going to have to figure that out, and you probably won't be able to do it, knowing you. President Trump told me that there were body bags outside the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Is this correct? I don't want to talk about particular things. Presidents get the chance to talk about things that some of the rest of us can't. But there was an, an enormous. Albeit indirect evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the center point for this. Remember, too, there were 14 American diplomats on the ground in Wuhan at this time, who were watching and observing what was taking place inside of Wuhan. I, I hope one day that we'll be able to get that information out more broadly. But I, as I come back to it, the cumulative evidence that one can see points singularly to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. If there was really no blame here, if this was really just some naturally occurring virus because someone ate a bat from a wet market, China wouldn't have done the things that they did. The Chinese Communist Party would not have shut down Wuhan. They would not have silenced doctors and scientists and journalists and disappeared some of them. John Ratcliffe was the United States Director of National Intelligence, the Overlord. Of 18 different agencies. When did the intelligence community first become aware that there was a virus spreading in Wuhan? You know, in late、uh, 2019, we have intelligence from both, you know, human intelligence sources and signals intelligence sources. And other intelligence sources that that were telling us that that there was some sort of a problem in in Wuhan. Key to that assessment was intelligence that three people working in the Wuhan Institute of Virology had become sick in October 2019. This was well before the first official case was eventually announced in late December. What Mike Pompeo and I put out is, you know, people became sick at the lab in October, and、uh, with symptoms that became entirely consistent with what、uh, most people have experienced around the world from COVID-19. Do you believe that to be the first cluster of the pandemic? Based on everything I've seen, this is the first cluster. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Former CIA director Mike Pompeo was Secretary of State during the pandemic. His knowledge of COVID-19 was second to none in the Trump administration. I have seen no evidence that there's a cluster that began any place but this. I am all ears to see of any evidence that presents some some facts set to the contrary. David Asher also agrees that this could have been the first cluster. Of the pandemic, my shock was that we had actually could have had foreknowledge. We could have known in November of 
that there was a d disaster on un occurring inside Wuhan, inside their most important biological facilities, you know, where uh, something absolutely tragic, traumatic, and dramatic was occurring, and we could have reacted to it. I said, we could have, you know, our, the whole world could have been different. It would have been like stopping 9-11 before it happened. Which raises the question, if US intelligence knew there was a virus in Wuhan in late 2019, why didn't they do anything about it? Was this an intelligence failure? We collect everything and know nothing in our governments these days. It's the big data problem. We're all drowning in it. We had the means to know something, but we didn't either analyze it or disseminate it or even know that it was collected. I always worry about that. As the former director of the CIA, I was always worried that we were collecting information, but we weren't able to process it sufficiently timely and get that information to the right places. Is this a pandemic that potentially could have been prevented had the intelligence agencies paid closer attention to the information that was coming in? Uh, I, we'll have to go look back at what was actually in the possession, what, what was the complexity of the information, what was the certainty of that information. Should there be a review? Sure, um, I think we always could go back and should go back and look at how we collected and what we knew and why it was we weren't able, that didn't send the signal up the line in a way that was, uh, would have led to a, a better outcome. Did they survive, those three workers who got sick? What I can say is that from the intelligence uh, perspective is we know that some of the people that were most involved um, either infected or um, reporting on or whistleblowing on or trying to get answers and, and uh, journalists report on um, have been difficult to track down later, at least from my time there. Um, and so, you know, I think that's consistent with what the Chinese Communist Party does, why, how, you know, the status of those individuals and why they've disappeared, I really can't comment on that. One of those people who was reported to have disappeared was Huan Yang Lin. Is she one of the ones that we believe fell sick with COVID-19? I don't know uh, her status, um, but, uh, you know, the information that you're talking about that's out in the public domain is consistent with what I've seen and what I'm familiar with. Huan Yang Lin was a researcher at the Institute. In early 2020, she disappeared from its website. Her social media presence also vanished. Despite Beijing's denials, many believe Huang was infected with COVID-19. She's never been seen since. You know, in the West, you might say, oh, this person just want just want to protect her privacy. In China, privacy in the interest of, of, of the state doesn't exist. So it would, have been, it would have been such a big triumphant media scoop for the Chinese government to showcase her, to give like 10 seconds of her appearing somewhere, making a speech, show up in the news media, and that would have basically you know, scored a major uh, victory for the Chinese propaganda machine. She never did. She is literally disappeared from public view. Uh, making people disappear is actually a major feature of the regime. I mean, uh, it's actually truly a People's Republic of Disappearances. <laughs> uh, dissidents, uh, uh, journalists, and anybody the government doesn't like, they disappear. They disappear into oblivion um, forever. This is basically a, a regime that is not only capable of doing these things and then doing this with great pride. And it's not only people that go missing. On the 12th of September 2019, the virus database at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was taken offline. 22,000 coronavirus samples gone. And that very same day, the Institute beefed up its security and issued a tender to replace its air conditioning system. This, in September, is when the evidence suggests a leak first occurred. What does that indicate to you about the origins of the virus and whether an outbreak might have 
occurred or become known to the Wuhan Institute of Virology at that early date. So I've seen data points that place it in the summertime of 2019, late summer, July, August of 2019. These are all parts of the pieces, right? Uh, th th this is all the cumulative weight of the evidence that suggests that it did come from this lab. And a month later, the Institute went into a communications blackout. There was no cell phone or signals activity on the compound for about two weeks. How significant would a, a blackout period at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, as has been reported, how significant would that be? And again, it would be another um, circumstance that would be difficult to explain other than there was a problem that the Chinese Communist Party was aware of and was trying to deal with before, uh, you know, it became an outbreak that was public and then ultimately a pandemic that affected every single person on the planet. Everyone around the world assumed it had come from an animal, but we didn't know what animal. In the early days of the pandemic, Australian scientist Nikolai Petrovsky made an extraordinary discovery. I guess the first surprising result uh, that we found that really stumped us for a while was there was no animal, and that opened, obviously, Pandora's box because then we had to start saying, well, if it didn't come from an animal, where did it come from? And of course, that, that led into, to, I guess, exploration of other possibilities. And, and one of those, of course, was that could this have potentially have come, you know, from a laboratory? <laughs> This video was part of the official launch of the Wuhan Institute of Virology's latest lab, BSL-4. It clearly shows there were bats in the lab. And that's a fact World Health Organization investigators said was a conspiracy. It was passed on to me by a group of scientists and researchers who've been digging into the origins of COVID-19. They call themselves drastic. When it, the outbreak happened, uh, a lot of people noticed that it's quite a coincidence that it happened in the same city where there's this premier lab studying coronaviruses and you know people were saying well that's suspicious and everybody who, th who said there could be more to it they were called conspiracy theorists yuri dagan is a genetic engineer from moscow he watched covid 19 spreading around the world in april 2020 yuri wrote an essay arguing that the animal to human theory just didn't stack up Can you detail some of the issues that you uncovered in that Medium paper that were just so crucial? Basically, it's that the Wuhan Institute of Virology that is located at the same, at the epicenter of the outbreak, has been creating a chimeric genetically modified coronaviruses for many, many years. And they've been uh, putting uh, these spike proteins from different viruses in their backbones and then studying like how well does that infect human cells. Just this alone forms a very plausible argument that this is actually the lab that hosts so many different coronaviruses, uh, explains the lab leak uh, the best. Yuri, this was highly risky coronavirus research that was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and no one seemed to be paying any attention to it. Yes, this kind of work of very dangerous, potentially pandemic pathogens, you know, being made more transmissible and potentially more lethal to humans, nobody paid attention to it because nobody cared about this kind of work in virology until the outbreak happened. To begin with, I, I certainly didn't approach the issue 
with any sort of suspicion or, 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 or foregone conclusions. However, things began to change as the pandemic evolved. So Richard Dearlove also ran into resistance to the lab leak theory. He's the former head of the British spy agency, MI6. Early in the pandemic, two scientists asked for his help in publishing a paper that cast doubt on COVID-19 coming from an infected animal. We approached nature, we approached science, we approached the American Journal of Virology, we approached various publications in the UK, and it was clear to me um, that there was a sort of united front not to put anything in the public domain um, which questioned um, the Chinese narrative. How disturbing is this censorship? And do you think it amounted to Chinese disinformation? I'm pretty sure that the Chinese, after the outbreak in Wuhan, um, and they're very good at doing this, sat down and, you know, developed their own information campaign. So, Richard, you were one of the first people internationally to come out and say, this virus may be the result of a laboratory leak. How were you treated after you made those remarks? I had people saying to me, Richard, my strong advice is you don't get involved in this issue. You know, it's, cons it's conspiracy theory. And I mean, my reply to them was, you know, if that's what you really think, you haven't really looked at the science, you don't understand the arguments, and I suggest you go back and delve into this a bit more deeply because you're going to find some pretty strange things when you do. Boy, did I get put-downs from, you know, some very uh, uh, important parts of government who basically were keen that I shut up. Was this by British government or British intelligence? I leave it to your imagination, given my past links. Another paper that struggled to find a home was from Professor Petrovsky. His research found the virus was better adapted to infect humans than any other animal, including bats. And, and we thought the, the, the scientific journals, particularly the leading ones, would, would actually jump on this paper because it, they like to have papers that are very topical, that are going to get a lot of media attention. Uh, and so we were quite stunned when we just got rejection after rejection after rejection without even the paper being looked at. Professor, this is censorship of science. Absolutely. And, of course, the more this happened, the more indignant I and, 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 and my colleagues, you know, uh, who were authors of the paper became because, you know, again, science is, is not about politics. It's not about, you know, only finding nice things. It's, it's about, you know, what is the truth? What are the facts? It's a sad story of uh, unprincipled compromise uh, in face of a authoritarian regime and also it is also a sad story of political wokeness because uh, the reason many scientists sign on to that kind of rhetoric to accuse anybody who is seriously interested in the possibility, not the certainty, but the possibility of a lab leak as simply racist. It is my profound honor to address the United Nations General Assembly. We must hold accountable the nation which unleashed this plague onto the world, China. Why were so many scientists against the lab leak theory? Well, one of the reasons was United States President Donald Trump. Yes, unfortunately, uh, you could say that the Trump factor contaminated the argument quite seriously. And I think there were a significant number of prominent scientists who did not want publicly to appear to be supporting Trump. We saw big media say, you know what, Donald Trump and his secretary of state are out talking about this thing. These people are surely crazy. They're, they're political zealots. They want a shiny object. I heard all the different stories. 
But of course, as we unpack it, as we accumulate data, science, evidence, facts, it's more clear than ever that the virus came from this laboratory. In early 2020, the medical journal The Lancet published a letter from a group of scientists saying the lab leak was a conspiracy. The man behind the letter was Peter Daszak. He's the president of EcoHealth Alliance, and he'd been working with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for 15 years, sending US grant money to Wuhan for bat research. He's the absolute expert on bat-borne coronaviruses in the United States uh, and, their, and their epidemiology, and that he assures us that the, the, the Chinese had provided him personally with uh, proof to, uh, to make it clear that, the, that this had come out of nature. But when we asked for this proof, when we asked the government agencies that had funded the work of EcoHealth and others, they couldn't give us that proof because they didn't have that proof. We looked at what certain scientists were saying, matching it with intelligence, and when it didn't match up, we were questioning it. But then we were, as we looked more closely at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know, what a lot of scientists like Dr. Fauci and Peter Daszak were saying was, there's no live bats there. There's no um, gain of function research there. There's no military there. And we had intelligence that was telling us that all of those things were occurring there. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock, and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. It took more than 12 months from the start of the pandemic for the World Health Organization to finally send a team to Wuhan to investigate the origins of the virus. The US submitted the names of three officials, but one they didn't suggest was picked, Peter Daszak. What we did see um, on the animal side is um, clear evidence that the, the Chinese scientists showed us, they found these, this information out from the market, that there was a pathway into that market of animals that we know are coronavirus Reservoirs are able to carry coronaviruses from places where the nearest related viruses are found. If you're telling us it came out of nature, you gotta give us proof. When we looked for proof for zoonosis through all of the cable traffic, all of the intelligence, everything, we could find almost nothing. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Uh, the, the Dashik was the guy. He was incredibly compromised in that sense. He should have recused himself. He should have said, nope, I can't be part of that. I, I was connected to this. I, had, I was involved in the funding of things that were taking place at this laboratory. It made no sense to put him on that group. He should have seen that himself, and certainly the leaders who were making the decisions about who to have be part of that commission should have seen that this conflict of interest would deny their report, whatever it was they were gonna put out, the credibility that I know they hoped that they would have. As to the possibility of COVID-19 coming from a lab, the WHO report found it extremely unlikely. They spent just three hours at the Institute and even Tedros walked away from the findings. That was a complete fiasco, the report. You know, it's 413 pages long and, and only three pages are devoted to the possibility that we're dealing with a lab uh, escapee. Well, the WHO is controlled by China. I dropped out of the, the World Health Organization. I thought it was ridiculous. They were late. They were wrong. They advised against travel restrictions. They, they objected to your travel ban from China. Well, they really did what China told them to do, if you think about it. They were like a mouthpiece for China. How beholden was the WHO and Dr. Tedros to China? Deeply beholden. Dr. Tedros owed his leadership role at the WHO to 
deals that were cut with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Dr. Tedros couldn't have been that next leader without the support of the Chinese Communist Party. And then we saw the behavior on the ground where he talked about how wonderful the Chinese Communist Party was behaving. They were doing all that they could. And we now know nothing could have been further from the truth. Again, this was, uh, th this was the tragedy, the central tragedy of the end of 19, the beginning of 20. It became political, not scientific. It became driven by personal uh, incentives and not the data set. Do you think there should be an investigation into Dr. Tedros's ties to China? <laughs> you know, uh, sure, but we already know an awful lot. <laughs> uh, the, the truth of the matter is that when the WHO was tasked with accomplishing the singular mission with which it was intended to accomplish, preventing global pandemic and the spread thereof, they fell down. And they fell down because they weren't willing to confront the perpetrator. They weren't willing to demand from the Chinese Communist Party that they be given access. They, they, they failed. They failed because of the absence of backbone and resolve. And the world is deeply worse off for this. Before the pandemic, much of the world had never heard of the term gain of function. Put simply, it's genetically manipulating a virus to give it new functions, like the ability to infect humans. That's what was happening inside the Wuhan lab. You know, there is quite a logical explanation when you look at the virus and its, its special characteristics that, you know, this is, the, this, this is the result of taking a natural virus and mucking around with it. COVID-19 is like a Frankenstein virus, and it looked to many scientists like it had been cobbled together. Because it has a bat virus backbone, with a pangolin virus spike protein, and a unique furin cleavage site in the same spot where Chinese scientists were genetically tweaking viruses. For those who keep bringing up, you know, the possibility of a bat in, in the wild markets in, in Wuhan having been the source of COVID-19, scientifically, that has, has really no merit because it can't infect that. So, so it couldn't have come straight across from a bat if it can't infect a bat. If COVID-19 was the result of gain of function, or other risky experiments at the Wuhan lab, remember this. That same lab was being partly funded by America. Dr. Fauci, knowing that it is a crime to lie to Congress, do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. Take an animal virus and you increase its yeah. transmissibility to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially. Dr. Anthony Fauci is America's top medical advisor. I found a scientific paper he wrote in 2012 where he argued the benefits of gain-of-function research were worth the risk of a pandemic. In total, American agencies funded 65 research projects at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So you don't want to go to Hoboken, New Jersey, or to Fairfax, Virginia, to be studying the bat-human interface that might lead to an outbreak. So you go to China. Are you concerned at all about how it happened that the gain-of-function ban was, was lifted during the Trump administration? 
How was it that Anthony Fauci was able to, to do this without anyone knowing? Well, I, I don't know for sure who all was involved in that decision-making process. I can, I can say this much. When we look back and figure out how that decision was made, I hope that all of those parties were able to come to the table, express their viewpoints, their concerns, so that we had not only a decision, but an informed decision that was made. I've seen very little evidence to date that there was a broad-based inf information exchange before the decision was made by Dr. Fauci to lift that ban on gain-of-function research. Mr. President, Anthony Fauci, did he ever once mention to you that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was genetically manipulating coronaviruses? Well, no, he didn't. And, you know, Anthony's been in government for many, many years. He's a, uh, a bureaucratic kind of a guy, a very great promoter. I give him an A-plus as a promoter and probably a C or a D as a doctor. We now know from emails that have been released under the Freedom of Information Act that he was getting his advice from the likes of Peter Daszak, a Wuhan collaborator. At the same time, he was telling you that this was a natural virus, while at the same time, behind the scenes in emails, he was having discussions about whether this might have been genetically manipulated. Does that shock you? Well, he was dealing with them, certainly, and my thing was a little bit different. I just wanted to stop it. Uh, whether it developed one way or the other, I just wanted to stop it. But it's important to know where it came from. It's extremely important to know how it developed. Fauci was dealing with them, and I guess they were even making payments for certain kinds of research. And I ended that, too. I stopped that. When we found out about that, he was doing that during the Obama years. And when I found out about it, I said, can you imagine that the United States is making payments to a Chinese lab? So just that on its face didn't make sense, but I stopped that. The Obama administration did hit pause on gain-of-function research, though, and that was lifted under your watch. Why did you allow the gain-of-function research to continue? Well, I think probably people that worked for me looked at it and at one point, they might have uh, done that, but ultimately, what we did was we shut it off. We shut the whole thing off, and we stopped making payments that were approved much earlier than our administration. Do you regret now not paying closer attention? I mean, this gain-of-function research is extremely risky, you know, banned under the Obama administration, and then kick-started in 2017 under your watch. Yeah, no, I, I think we've done an incredible job between the vaccine and between all of the Operation Warp Speed. I think we did a great job, and people are now starting to see what a great job we did. While writing my book, I discovered a crucial piece of the COVID-19 puzzle. Cybersecurity analysts at Internet 2.0 recovered Chinese government data that had been virtually wiped from the web. It showed there was a buy-up of PCR equipment used to test for coronaviruses in Wuhan in 2019. The next month, one of those machines went to the Wuhan Institute. Is this something you're aware of, that they bought a PCR machine in November 2019? I wouldn't be able to comment on that. How significant would this purchase be? Would be significant. Is it a smoking gun? U ultimately, I don't think there's ever going to be one specific smoking gun. Um, I think there's um, more than just smoke here. I think there's fire from a whole bunch of different sources. Um, I think that would be another compelling piece of uh, evidence if you need more. I don't need more. Mr. President, I just want to ask you about this idea that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has strong ties to the Chinese military and was working on secret projects with the Chinese military. Do you think SARS-CoV-2 was developed as a bioweapon? So, I'd like to think it wasn't, and I'll probably have to leave it at that, because I want to give the benefit of a doubt 
and China was also affected by it. So I really don't think it was, but nobody can really know for sure. And certainly now, most of that evidence is gone, and it's going to be very hard to find out. That evidence was the viral database which was taken offline by the Institute. There's also early samples that were destroyed and the people who disappeared. But what is very evident is the lab's close ties to the Chinese military. It's definitely possible that the Chinese have been working on a bioweapon. Their labs affiliated with the PLA have been working on coronaviruses as either a bioweapon or as a defense against a potential bioweapon. And they've you know, published papers in China about both aspects, saying that, oh, we can weaponize coronaviruses. That actually would make a good, good bioweapon. And also they published papers and said, we have to be prepared for a potential you know, uh, released bioweapon. Whether this precise you know, virus is the result of a bioweapons program, I highly doubt it, uh, but I could not rule it out. Nor is David Asher ruling it out. In fact, the former COVID-19 investigator believes something went badly wrong inside the Wuhan Institute of Virology. My concern was that the Chinese were doing research in, uh, as we learned later, quite uncontrolled circumstances that was most definitely related to biological warfare ambitions in the future, and that they had had an accident of a secretive program that they never wanted anyone to know about uh, because it was a weapon, and, and the weapon had gotten uh, released errantly. I mean, it was like someone dropping a nuclear weapon out the back of a B-52 and bombing some city and saying, whoops, uh, we didn't mean for that to occur. Do you think this was an accidental or deliberate release of COVID-19 from China? So I think it was probably an accident. I don't think it was uh, on purpose. If it was, that's essentially war. I don't think it was on purpose. I think it was incompetence. Scientists walked out and had lunch outside in a park or something with the girlfriend, and he had it, and she had it. Was that patient zero, that scientist from the lab? I don't know if it's patient zero or, or patient something else, but that's one theory. Do you know how he was infected? I think that it was incompetence. I think that, it's, that it escaped from the lab through incompetence. And they've also had some safety problems, as you know, at that lab. Has the United States spoken to defectors who worked in the lab, who blew the whistle on what happened? I really can't talk about that. Yeah, I cannot talk about that. I won't be uh, really allowed to talk, nor would I want to. Few people in our nation's history have been more challenged or found a time more challenging or difficult than the time we're in now. Once in a century virus, it silently stalks the country. Almost four months after becoming president, Joe Biden ordered a probe into the origins of COVID-19. The results, inconclusive. The report found two causes plausible. Either it came from a lab or an infected animal. Is there still major intelligence that goes to proving the virus came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology that's still not in the public domain? Yes, there's compelling intelligence that hasn't been declassified. When you declassify intelligence, you, you, you risked, you know, the potential human sources or signals intelligence where you're where your eyes and ears into the to their actions are coming from. And so we put out as much as we felt we could safely do um, at the time. But I think the time has come for the Biden administration to declassify additional information that would, again, um, uh, more evidence if you need it, that the Chinese Communist Party officials acted badly, bullied international officials, um, covered up intelligence and reporting on this. 
um, there is more intelligence out there and I'd like to see it uh, declassified because it'll create additional pressure, not just on Chinese Communist Party officials, but others that still continue to deny that China is a bad actor here. We had an opportunity in January 2020 to eradicate this virus out of the whole human population, and that's really sad. Uh, because, you know, in, in 50 years' time, our children's children, you know, might one day look back and say, why didn't anyone stop this virus when you had the opportunity in that first few weeks? From his lab in Australia, Nikolai Petrovsky is developing a vaccine that's in phase three clinical trials. But he fears that COVID-19 may become a way of life. So viruses are opportunists. Um, they find themselves in this wonderful new host of which there's billions and it's learning as it goes. It started as an exquisite human pathogen. If we look now at, at strains like the Delta strain, you know, it's, it's, it's going from bad to worse. I mean, and, and, and this is what happens when you have something that is already the perfect human pathogen. It won't stop there because you, it's already, you know, has, has its foot in the door. And, and it can only get better over time. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why, you know, it's, it's been so scary. Is this what the future looks like? If this virus is allowed to spread and disseminate, it's gonna learn more tricks. Uh, it's gonna become more infectious because that's the way viruses travel. Uh, they're opportunists. Uh, and it's gonna reach a point where we'll never actually free ourselves because it's found we're such a wonderful host species, it doesn't ever want to leave. How do you think this global pandemic, this crisis of a potential laboratory leak could impact on Chinese leadership? Well, my view is that the implications of this for the PRC leadership are severe. There will be factions who are hugely dissatisfied with what has happened, with the way that Chinese reputation is damaged, the way that, you know, China now becomes something akin to an international pariah. So uh, I, I, I think the consequences of this will be severe politically in China over the next four or five years. Watch this space. Something will give, something will happen. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it brings Xi Jinping down, or at least there isn't a contest around his concept of leadership. And as for two of the most senior members of the Trump administration, they are in no doubt about what really happened in Wuhan. Well, listen, the, the people that had the most access to the most intelligence are telling you that the most likely origin of, of COVID-19, of the Wuhan virus, was what happened, was a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is really most likely what happened. And it's more than just a possibility. It's certainly a probability, and it's probably a certainty. The other thing that the cover-up tells you is the absolute absence of humanity of these leaders. They are willing to allow people to die. They don't care about human life. They don't value them the way that people in the West, in the United States and Australia do. They are prepared to let millions of people die if that's what it takes to protect their regime.